I've been looking at something that I want to deal with in the sessions that have been allotted to me during this week, during this time. And it, it comes out of a manual that we have done uh, called, If Any Man Be in Christ. Now this manual was done several years ago. And, uh, and I was really drawn of the Lord once again concerning our union with Christ. I dealt with it on the monthly CDs, on those lessons, our union with Christ, and, and in and several other places where I've been and in here too. And we've been looking at John chapter 14 through chapter 17, but particularly John chapter 14. And you know what the Lord says there from verse 1 through 3, and that I will receive you unto myself, unto myself, that where I am ye may be also. And then he explains that, or at least he makes another statement concerning that in the 20th verse. And he's referring to his coming again, which took place at Pentecost. Uh, and that's what he was, is, is referring to in chapter 14 all the way through chapter 17 and particularly in, uh, in, in 15 and 16. But that's what he's talking about. That's the coming he is talking about. And the word again there, as you well know, means in newness anew, I will come anew. As if to say, I came the first time in flesh, I come the second time in spirit. I came the first time to take away the first. I come the second time to establish the second. The first always being the natural, the fleshly, and the second, the spiritual. At any rate, that's what he's talking about and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Verse 20 shows that to be a threefold relationship. And for years, for years, I have, along with others, spent a lot of time sharing concerning Christ in you and you in Christ. That in Christ reality. If any man be in Christ. And that's what this is about. And Christ in you. We've those two things primarily. But here he says, in that day you will know, I am in my Father. And I had, well, let me put it this way. The Lord had never quickened that to my very soul. Never had. The next, the next statement is, and you in me, and I in you. And primarily, chapter 17 is the same, is the same. But in chapter 17, the first five verses is where the Lord is praying to the Father. And basically what he is saying is, I am in my Father. I mean, that's, that's what that's a result of. Because what he says there is, Father, glorify thy Son, even as I have glorified thee on the earth. And then he goes on and says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Glorify me with thyself. The whole point of making that statement and Christ praying that prayer is that he, in order to in order to become obedient to the death of the cross, in order 
to become, well, our salvation. In order to, to fulfill all that was spoken of him by the prophet. He had to leave that union, that glory. He had to leave the Father. But he had to leave the glory. He had to leave the glory into which he brings you and I through union with him bringing many sons unto glory. But if you read that, if you read that, it's talking about he died. It's talking about his death. So that he might bring many sons unto glory. And that's, you know, that's all it says. But you begin to look at at the words of the Lord Jesus there in John particularly and in some other places too and begin to real and, 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 and in uh, chapter chapter 12 chapter 12 of John same same thing but anyway you begin to see that the one that left the son that came out is the son that returned but he did not return empty that has to do with him being the firstborn son which we're talking about on the monthly CDs right now the inheritance of the firstborn but nonetheless when he returned he returned with his own body he returned having you and I in him. For you're dead. Your life is hid with God in Christ or hidden with Christ in God. And that's in reference to Hebrews 9.24 where it says Christ for now that he now appears in the presence of God for us, but it's the word there means on our behalf. It doesn't mean that we're not there. It means that we are there in him. He appears, but he presents us. He presents his body. He presents, Isaiah says, I will send forth my word. My word shall not return unto me void, but will accomplish the thing for which it is purposed. And Christ returned to the Father, accomplishing that for which he was purposed. And that is the bringing of many sons unto glory. That was not only, that is not only a thing that he, that he did, it is a thing that is continually ongoing because every time a person is born again and by the Spirit placed in Christ, they are, as one with him, his body, presented to the Father. Paul says this in Ephesians 1, just getting started when he says, accepted, he has known us from before the foundation of the world, chosen us in Christ. Why? Basically, that we might be accepted in the beloved. There's no other way we can be accepted except we be in Christ. John 14 again, verse 6 says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man is going to make it to the streets of gold except by me. That isn't what he says. That isn't what he says. He doesn't say, I'm come to show you a way so you can get to heaven and miss hell. That isn't even what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the Father's house and coming to the Father. That's what he's talking about. Bringing many sons unto glory. The very glory out from which he came is the glory 
into which he entered. Bring it, and he didn't come empty, but presented that which all, in fact, that the Father had given him. And that's the ones he's praying for in John 17. All thine are mine, and all mine are thine. And I pray that they may be one, even as we are one, as thou art in me and I am in you, that they may be one in us. It goes on and on. Now, hon, that's a little more than just, you know, having sins forgiven. That's a little more than just not going to hell. That whole concept is beyond my ability to even imagine. Far beyond it. To think that the Son of God himself, he who was in the beginning with God, was God, same in the beginning with God, known there as the Word of God, by whom God did all that he did, that one dwells in you right now. That's the one. Had he not left the Father, he would not be dwelling in you right now or any other time. That's what it was all about. That God have many sons in that one son because the one son is what in glory is all about. He's the glory for God's sake. He's the glory of God in you, and, and, and by your union with him, you are dwelling in glory, in the glory of God, the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. And that's the glory under which he returns. Father, glorify me with thine own self. Think about this a minute, folks. I mean, it wasn't like he was born of a virgin and and by some means, and then he walked along, and then he got a call from God, and, and then John said great things about him, and then he started preaching, and the Jews got mad at him, and they took him out and killed him. No. That was purpose before there ever was a world created. Before there was ever a man scooped up out of the dirt before there was ever a soul breathed into that earthen form. Way before all of that, the eternal plan, purpose, and will of God, which he purposed in himself, was established in his Son. And it required that he leave glory. And this is what Philippians is about. Philippians talks about that. Paul writing in the book of Philippians talks about that. Chapter 2. Though being in the form of God, he counted it not robbery. In other words, he not a thing to be grasped and held on to is what the word means. It's a poor translation in the English but made himself of no reputation. Now, son, huh? He became of no reputation when he became the best of us, not the worst of us, because he never sinned. Made himself of no reputation. Took upon himself the form of a servant. And, it, and goes on. And then being found as a man. Became obedient unto death. But that wasn't so they could, he could just die like any other man died. No. <clears throat> Not that. Not that kind of a death. Even the death of the cross. Which was the death of Absolute obedience. 
closest thing you'll see to it in type and shadow is Abraham and Isaac. Absolute obedience unto God. So that's what he left. Now that's why he said, because he says, I mean, you know, for him it's a round trip. I've said that very often. For me it's a one way. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one way. I've never been there. And so it's not me returning. It's me coming up unto him. I'll receive you unto myself. A place where you've never been before. A place where you could never come on your own. And in me, you will find the Father. And that's the reason he told them, you will know that I am in my Father. That I am in my Father. See, I couldn't say that enough. I could sit here and say it all night. I, I, I can't, I have never been able to get past that. And I have to admit to you that I haven't really even begun to understand by the Spirit of God, because you're not going to understand by the, the Adamic mind, but to understand that kind of union into which we have been brought. Now, I've got a reason for saying all of this because I've said it all again and again and again, but I've got a reason for saying it tonight. I want to, I want to look at something objectively and then I want to look at something subjectively and it is absolutely necessary that we look at it objectively. In other words, that we see it as it is. That we see it as Christ is. The absoluteness. Not only of what he has done, but of who he is. Throughout the scriptures, as Paul writes in his epistles and, and, and in John even, concerning seeing Christ as he is. Not as we would like him to be or think he is or, or you know, not, not seeing him... Uh, Just seeing him as he is. Seeing him as he is. John, you know, writes about that. And, 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 and Paul says the same thing in Colossians 3, only he doesn't use the as he is, but it says, who is Christ who is our life, when Christ who is our life, Christ who is, Christ who is, wonderful thing about the Greek language, no more than I know of it, but it's a wonderful thing anyway because it's such a kind of a picturesque, explaining, living type. Uh, English is, is wonderful, and I speak English and wish everybody else did too, but it's, it's just dead. No, it really is. It has no action to it. I mean, it has a bunch of action verbs, but in the, in the Greek, uh, you know, everything is, 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 is being activated. You, you look at the literal concordant tran, translation of the Bible, and it will be, and he said, and it will, it, it will it'll translate it, and he is saying. And that thrills me because that's true. He is still saying. I mean, you know, uh, his words just don't come out and then drop down on the ground and go away. What he says, he's always saying. Who he is, he always is. He is the living word of God, and he never changes, and yet the newness is beyond my imagination of that. We could just, we could just sit here and talk about it. But that's Christ, honey, and that's who he is, and where he is is in you and in me. And it's absolute. 
He will never be in you more than he is right now. If you are born from above, Christ is in you. You are baptized by the Spirit of God. You are baptized into Christ. It is a work of the Spirit. You have been, you've been brought into that kind of union with Him by the Spirit of God. Those things are not up in the air. They're not up for question. It is part of what we call the finished work of God, but most people, and this is really the truth, the majority of the folks that I've heard throw that term around haven't got the slightest idea what they're talking about. Not at all. They're either relating it all to something of sin or they're relating it all to something that is of a sin consciousness. I don't know. But I've come to understand that the finished work of God, that work finished in Christ, is not measured even by what we think He did. Not measured by what He did. It's measured by who He is. The finished work of God is who Christ is. Because the Lord Jesus never did anything that wasn't an expression of himself. And that is certainly so at the cross. At the cross. At the cross. And he brought death to its end. You realize that? He brought the righteousness of the law, of the law itself, to its end. He brought the Adamic creation to its end. And then, and then not only that, he brought promises of God, prophecies, Throughout the scripture to its end. I mean, its completeness, its goal. He never sinned, but he made of himself a perfect sacrifice for sin in that he had none. In that he had none. He made himself the perfect body or the Father prepared that body for him and that body was not, though it was from the womb of Mary, it wasn't of the seed of Joseph. But it was such a body that he could bear the death and the dying of all mankind from the first Adam to the last that will ever be born of a woman. He gathered all of that up in the cross. He did that because of who he was. And so the cross is just that kind of a manifestation. That kind of a manifestation of the Son himself. So I'm just saying that the finished work is not a bunch of things, it's a person. God isn't pleased and satisfied and all the other words that we could use along that line, hon, with a bunch of things done. But with the one in whom they are all done. The one who did it. The son in whom I am well pleased. The son wherewith he hath loved us. It's the son, darling. Everything of your salvation is the son. 
Now, there's nothing been said so far that you haven't heard or, and haven't heard a lot of times, and probably nothing much is going to be said beyond that, but I've still got something to say. I want you to see this because then, by the grace of God, I want to be able to deal with it in the subjective. And that's where we'll focus on you and on me. Because we have this treasure in us. We have this great salvation, the Son of God dwelling in us. He's not sitting in a chair next to me. He's in me. He is in me. He is who he is. One of the questions I used to face was, who am I? Who am I? But we're not going there right now. So we're talking about the reality of our union with Christ. It is based upon and grounded up in his union with the Father and nothing less than that. When he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, no man can come, no man cometh to the Father. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about, honey. The place prepared of God happens to be a person. That person is his son who buildeth the house. His son, who in his death destroyed the first house, and in his divine, glorious resurrection and glory, he establishes the second house, the last house, whose house you are. Not Moses, but Christ. Moses a servant over his house, Christ the son, whose house you are. Why? Because he lives in you. Because he lives in you. And he doesn't live in a borrowed house. And he doesn't live in somebody else's house. He lives in his house. He lives in the house that wouldn't exist but by him. Because the only reason you and I are the house of God, hon, is because he lives in us. Now, we need to get that down. I've, I've heard people, I've read stuff for years and in many cases, many cases, the great, the, the thing that is being focused upon and the thing that is being, you know, preached is, you know, the we are bit. Not he is, not he is, not he is, and particularly not he is now come. But we are. We are this and we are that and we are something else. And, and while there is a glimmer of truth to that, in and of ourselves, we are nothing. We're not a house that Jesus went shopping for, liked it, found it, bought it with his blood, and then moved into it because it was such a glorious place for him to live. That's not the picture, honey. It's his house. It was planned of God again before the foundation of the world. We were chosen in Christ. Not a house made with hands, or so certainly not natural. It's made together by the gathering together of all things in union with Christ. Him being the foundation, him being the chief cornerstone, him being the capstone. Him being the full measure of the grace of God. When the old prophet is talking about this, that capstone, that headstone, and he's pouring the oil up on it and crying out, grace, 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 grace. The whole grace of God poured out upon the head of the corner. 
making Christ the full measure of God's grace. That grace whereby we are saved. It's Christ, hon. I'm telling you, if you would just, just listen to what I'm saying and do some searching. Do some searching. You will find nothing, nothing of our salvation in the Bible that is not summed up in him. In the whole of the scripture, there is only one to come. And that one is come. And everything in him is come by him. Everything. Now, this may be some of the things we look at as we, as we go along, not just me saying it to you. But looking at the scripture, that is declaring it as well. Our union with Christ, being in Christ. You shall know that I'm in my Father. Just think about that. He made that whole cycle. Coming out from the Father, returning to the Father, and bringing in himself, in union with himself, those that are given to him of the Father, because there's none in Christ except them they are given to him by the Father. And everything that the Father has given to him returns in him to the Father that in all things, even as Christ, God be glorified. Now you'll read that in bits and parts through the scripture, but that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It is about the Son glorifying the Father and bringing us who are born from above, who are born anew, bringing us unto himself in that glory. Yeah. The greater glory of the latter house is Christ himself. But, hon, what I just keep wanting to say, because, we, you know, we're just picking up pieces and bringing them together, but the point that I want, the one that I'm talking about here is the one right now who lives in you. Now, darling, he either lives in you, he either lives, let me put it for me, he either lives in me or I'm deader than the wood that this table is made of. But the life that God has given is not some kind of a half-baked, half-hearted attempt at some kind of a salvation or some kind of a deliverance. No. The life that God planned, purposed, and hath given is nothing less than his eternal, his eternalness. Who is the eternalness of God? The Son. Who is eternal life? Well, that's believers living a long time. No, it didn't. Eternal life is not me living a long time. Eternal life is one. It is Christ who alone, who alone is eternal life. Who alone can say, by the Spirit of God, I am he that liveth. 
and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. But not only that, he has accomplished something in that, let me just call it that round trip. And he did that at the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection and triumphed over all of it. But the end of all of that was that God have sons in the one son. Or we could say that God would have the increase of that son. Now, how would he have an increase? By living in many. By living in many. All of whom are one. One body, one house, right on down the line. All one. And we've been brought into a union that the natural mind simply cannot consider. You can't do it. You can't do it. Because the natural mind judges everything based upon natural hearing, natural seeing, natural knowing based upon the wrong creation, the, the first creation, the natural creation, based everything upon that. Our idea that everybody becomes one and, and, and everybody, you know, comes to set everybody down around a conference table and, and get them to at least agree to disagree for a period of time and so that things will seem peaceful. The name of God's conference table is the cross. He brings the whole humanity there in the body of his only son. Only son. That son that will shortly be from that time that he brings him there to that cross, will shortly be the firstborn out from among the dead and the only begotten of the Father from among the dead. And therefore, he will be not only the head, but he will be the substance of the body of a new creation in union with himself. In Christ. Think about that. That's what you read in the scriptures. Think about that. Think about that. Brings us to the cross. Ever Jew, ever Gentile, no matter what other kind of a gender or what, no, Jew, Gentile, all of humanity is gathered into that. I mean, there isn't, it's either Jew or Gentile. No matter what color, no matter what, I don't care. Jew, Gentile. And he brought both of them. And he reconciled them unto God. What does that mean? He reconciled them by the death of his son. Not by the life of him. By the death of his son. What did he do? He, he put him to death in Christ. I mean, that's, that's real reconciliation. That's real reconciliation. And out of that death came a new Jew and a new Gentile. No, absolutely not. Out of that death came this son who had left glory 
and took that body upon himself and put it to death, obedient unto his father, and said, you will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you suffer thy holy one to see corruption. One son, the same son that died and became everything that was not by the Spirit of God. Gathered it into himself. See, honey, not just a bunch of things we did, not just a bunch of sins and then paid the price and ransomed us out so we're just out here running around on borrowed time like a bunch of escaped convicts. And that's not true. The true is we're dead. Period. And you who are alive are alive only because this one who is raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father lives in you. Now I've spent this whole time, these minutes that are here, not as many as I thought, talking about the significance of him saying, you will know that I am in my Father. I am in my Father. And you are in me. That's the reason I am the way, the truth, the life, and that's the reason no man can come up to the Father but by me. Through union with me, by the Spirit, you, be, you become part of my union with the Father. But it's a glorious thing, hon, because it, it is summing everything up. You know, the, the thing you'll see in chapter 17 of John over and over and over and over and over and over is one, the word one. One, that they be one, in one. I mean, over and over again. What I'm sitting here tonight just talking with you about is the one. It's not you. It's not me. It's him. My Lord God, hon, we're one because the one lives in us. And if the one doesn't live in you, you're not even close to being one or anything else. And yet we look every place except in him for what we call oneness, for what we call union, for what we call being joined together. We look everywhere, Christianity does, except to him. He's the only one by whom it can possibly work because he is the only one, O-N-E, one that there is. There isn't another one. There's angels of God, there's spirits, there's this, there's that. But Christ is the only one. One faith, one truth, one baptism, one judgment, one glory, one expectation. It's all Him. That's Him. And He lives in you. That's the only way that you and I, but it is the way. There's not a better way or another way. That we are one body. And that's because the living one 
dwells in us. Making us his own body. And who lives in his body? He does. Who is the resurrection of his body? That was dead. But that's when he did away with the old. But now it is alive. Because he is the resurrection of it. He is the resurrection and the life. He doesn't simply give life and he doesn't do resurrections. He is the resurrection and the life and he's in you. All right? Now that's what we're talking about in a little thumbnail scratch. We're talking about if any man be in Christ. Well, any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Darling, see, I'm, I'm really fighting not jumping up into the subjective because that's where the Lord began to deal with me several days ago when I, when I, before we ever set up a schedule of teaching and really impressed upon my heart to bring this truth of our being in Christ into a subjective reality. A reality in which in which we're involved. But in this case, the subjective, it really depends upon and is based upon a God-given, spirit-worked understanding of the, ob of the objective. Comprehending our union with Christ will have and does have tremendous effect, tremendous consequences in our soul. Tremendous. Just tremendous. And we want to talk about that uh, as we go along. Well, it's a reality that has to take place in our hearts. We do not understand salvation except by understanding our union with Christ. Because that's what salvation is. It is that very thing which God chose himself from before the foundation of the world. He hath chosen us in Christ. We didn't choose that. We weren't around to choose it. He chose it. And that's the salvation that he brings us into, and it's the only salvation we are. Now, honey, if you think you're on a skip to Malou trail, going down the yellow brick road to see the Wizard of Oz somewhere in a place that has gold streets, then you're wrong. What we've come to, if we have come to anything, and there may be a lot of people who think they're Christians and all they've come to is a joining a church. 
and may not even be a Christian, may not even be truly born again, may not be, but if you are truly born again, you have been brought into a union that only the Father himself who knows this Son can show to you. And that Son showing you the Father. And that, my friend, is a bona fide work of the Spirit of God and not of man. Man's understand. Mine or yours, either one. I'm as helpless as a baby in a basket floating down the river when it comes to that. It's a work of the Spirit, hon. It's not us sitting in a smugness, and I'm not saying that you do or that any of us do, but I'm saying it is not us sitting in a smugness of a teaching and thinking that all we have these gatherings for is so we can teach lessons and teach teachings and teach theology. When here we set the living, 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 living body of the indwelling Son of God. And that's the reality that we're here to share with each other. In spirit, in truth, that reality. But, hon, that's a reality that you have to live by. See, I hate to say that because it sounds like that it's something you've learned, now you've got to make it work. No, that isn't what I'm saying. But I'm saying that reality is something you must come to live by. Or why, I mean, Jesus either, either lived as the Son of God or why be the Son of God? We either live as His body, or why be His body? We either live one to another and unto the Father in union with Christ and live as an expression of that union, or why have the union? Because it's not some kind of a jerk knee theology. It, it is a union into which we are brought by the Spirit of God. And it is the coming of understanding that begins to work in our heart according to that union, according to what Paul said. Not I. I mean, do you think he just woke up one morning and dreamed that? As a result of knowing the Son, the Son whom the Father alone truly knows, revealed in Paul. And he woke up in an understanding. I am crucified. My God. So much for me having to learn the law. I'm just as dead as a doornail. Did Christ die, hon? I mean, did he vacate the body of his flesh? Did his dead head fall over on a dead shoulder and he give up the ghost? Was that all an act? You know it wasn't. But as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. It is not about
I must say this, and I'll, I'll come back, because I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my time. It's not about my death. It's about his death. Now, that's the death that we are drawn to. It's the death we are drawn into. It's the dress, death into which we are buried. But it's still his death. He's the one that died. He's the one that brought all humanity into that death, in, but it was in his body that was prepared for him of God. None of this was left up for me to do or for you to do. Because he's already done it. My point is, where it becomes incumbent upon my soul, is when that one, who is the finished work of the Almighty God, moves into my soul. Now honey, that's when it ceases to be a theology and becomes a living person, a living spirit, occupying my dead soul, giving me life that he is. There's, there's consequences to that. There's reality to that. It's not me and Jesus walking down life's road together anymore. It's Christ living in me. It is I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Oh, yeah. A whole lot more than I did before I was crucified with Christ because before I was crucified with Christ, I was dead, completely dead in sin. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. So he says, I will not leave you fatherless or comfortless. I'm not going to go away and stay away and maybe come again two or three thousand years. I will come anew and I will receive you. You that I'm talking to right now, you, my disciples, and not only that, but all those who come to me through your word, I will receive unto myself. For I am, you may be also. I will not leave you without a father, comfortless. I will come to you. And because I live, you shall live also. That's all right there. And with that coming, you will understand. You will know that heaven has opened its doors and I have come in. The King of glory has come in to the heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a union. See, darling, there's no other way for us to get there except in him. 
There's not a substitute. Now, I'm not going to sit here and run down all the substitutes and say, you know, I don't believe in this and don't believe in that. It's not important what I don't believe in. The only thing that's important is whether we know Christ or not, whether we are seeing him or not, whether we are actually experiencing, whether, whether your soul, my soul, because that's the important thing about us. This, 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 this body isn't seeing anything. I mean, you know, that unless it's temporal, stand still long enough for it to look at it. But we're seeing, but with the eyes of our soul, it's important that we're seeing him. Because he is the sum total of our salvation. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So it's important that we see him and comprehend because when is it that I really and you really come to realize that we're in Christ? I've said it over and over again. This manual says it hundreds of times probably. And I'm still going to talk with you about this same thing, but in another, another aspect of it. How is it? How is it that we know we're in Him? How is it when He who is our life? shall appear. Phanero, apocalypsum, you know that. Revealed and made manifest the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, filling my soul, your soul, enlightening the eyes of our understanding, a light by which we can see. But by that light, you don't see things, you see the life of that light when he who is our life shall appear. And who is he talking to? You who are raised together with Christ. It's in Colossians 3, 1 through 4. You who are, who are not mindful of the world. Why? Because you are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And when he who is our life shall appear. See, this is not a far and distant place. This is in you. Then, when then, I love those two words there because they are original words. I love them. When. And it's whenever, but when. Christ who is our life shall appear. Then. I mean, even one of the pre... Even one of the even one of the the, the, the commentators who, who is who's just totally uh, futurist and all of that makes a big deal out of that. Then, and he, I bet he writes a half a paragraph on no other time, not until then, no other way but then, no time except at that time. Of course, he's looking for him to appear in the sky. And I'm looking for him to appear and see in his appearing where Paul said he was, in me and in you, who are quickened together, raised together, seated together. And that's what Paul says there. Since then ye be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above, where Christ setteth. And you in him, by the way. And not on the earth. Why? Because you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ and God. And when that life appears, then shall you appear with him in glory. And hun, all of that is in your very soul. When he appears, the light of life, the glory of God, the understanding of the Lord, the, the, the Christ of God, when he appears, 
and you see him, immediately you appear in his presence as one who is where he is. You appear in his glory. No flesh shall glory in his presence. No flesh shall glory in his presence. But you're not appearing there as flesh anyway. It is one in whom Christ is dwelling. That's when it locks into your soul. My Lord, I am in you. I am in you. You are my dwelling place. You're my life. You're my resurrection. And you are my dwelling place. Hallelujah. Wherever on earth I am, I am there in you. And that's the very thing that I want to talk to you about. Because, honey, you don't make that so. Christ is in you and you're in Christ. I'm telling you, sitting right here in this building, you're in Christ. You're going to leave this building, you'll still be in Christ. You're in Him. It's an eternal reality. It is a relationship gathered into itself. Bible scholars say, Time, place, and state of being in Christ. See? Time, place, state of being. It's a relationship. The little word en in the Greek, defining a relationship. It's in Christ. That's where you are. That's the objective view. And it is a true view. It is a view determined of God, a work determined of God. We didn't build this house that we are. He did and still is adding lively stones to it by His very Spirit. See, that's the thing about that house. I don't add fullness to it. I find fullness in it because He's the fullness any man be in Christ. I trust. I want to talk to you about the government and I want to talk to you about the kingdom. Because if you're in Christ, you are in the kingdom of God. There's no way you can separate it. You're not in Christ waiting for a kingdom. You're not in Christ going to one day go to a kingdom. That wouldn't make sense. No, the thing is all put together. Kingdom brings us into a different aspect of that union and awakens in our heart a different aspect. Kingdom relates to a king, and the king relates to a throne, and that all relates to a government. Something that governs us. Something that governs us in every situation, every opportunity, every problem, every place, concerning every person, concerning everything. No matter. We are governed. There's a government. There's a government. Hallelujah. Why? Because you're not just there. Honey, if you're in Christ now, I'm, I'm finished, but I'm telling you, you've got to get a hold of this. I know hundreds and hundreds, well, more Christians than I could count. And so small a number, percentage-wise, actually comprehend the reality of what it means to be in Christ. 
It's a whole lot easier to believe it's a place we're going one day. You're not going there, you're there. You're baptized there. You're born there by spirit. You're in Christ. Why? Because he's in you. That's the union. You in me and I in you. Even as I am in my Father. Oh, hallelujah to God. But there's a government to that. You think that in all things Christ was obedient to the government of his Father? All things. Well, I'm just throwing that out. We'll talk about it later. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Blessed be the Lamb of the living God. Father, thank you for the reality of being in thy holy Son. By which, through which, in whom we have union with you who created this soul even as thy son redeemed it in his blood. Glory to the Lamb of the living God. Father, deal with our hearts in this meeting. Let us not walk away from here simply having heard words, simply having gotten lessons. Oh no, my Lord, let there be an opening of our eyes that we may see the reality of all things in the very person of the Son. Hallelujah. We thank you for it. Amen. Amen. Well, that's it.